Good evening from New York. I'm Selwyn Collins, your host of CWS Journeys. Thank you for joining us this evening. And if you're joining for the first time, much, much appreciation. Thank you. Our guest this evening is Ms. Cheryl A. Harris, who is the founder and principal attorney of Harris Law, PLLC. She has over 25 years of legal experience, has litigated a variety of cases from inception through trial in the courts of New York and negotiated hundreds of settlements. She's a former partner of Idel Petuni, Murphy & Bach, LLP, where she was the form first partner of African descent. There she headed the form's employment law group and defended major medical centers in complex, high exposure medical malpractice litigation, in addition to handling risk management and regulatory matters. Ms. Harris was also a member of the Forum's Products Liability Litigation Group. She has also represented certain members of the United States Congress before the United States Courts of Appeal for the Second Circuit in the Ground Zero litigation stemming from the 9-11 attacks. I will take a very short break and when I return I'll introduce you to Ms. Harris. I am back and the uh, lovely woman next to me is Ms. Cheryl Harris. Cheryl, good evening and welcome to CWS Journeys. Good evening, Selwyn. Thanks for inviting me. Cheryl, tell us a bit about your education background and, and how you leverage that today. Well, where do you want me to start? Um, I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, product of uh, uh, the public school system education system in Barbados. I was born and raised there um, and uh, uh, I went to school there until age 15 and a half when I moved to New York. Um, came here and went to um, public school right here in Brooklyn, uh, Tilden High School. Uh, and uh, from Tilden I went on to uh, uh, do my bachelor's at Mount Holyoke College in Massachusetts, which is one of the Seven Sisters Colleges. Uh, and following that, I did my law degree at Columbia Law uh, and uh, went from there immediately into private practice to work for um, um, a private firm mm -hmm. uh, doing litigation principally. Be beyond the accomplishments, the academic and business, I'm going to use the word productivity of success. How, how would you describe this woman most have come to know as Cheryl Harris? Um, I, I like the, the emphasis on productivity as opposed to success uh -huh. um, because that, that you know word is a loaded word and it, it means and should mean different things to different people but um, I would like to, I like to think that um, uh, I've been productive. Mm -hmm. I, I like to think that I um, have used the tools and the skills and the opportunities that um, were placed before me and, and principally I have to credit my parents for doing that, mm -hmm. showing me various opportunities, but not only my parents, obviously people that I encountered along the way, uh, and that um, I used those to uh, build a productive life and contribute to society. Uh, and that I think you can do, every one of us can do just by uh, being a contributing member of civil society. So, uh, you know, that's, that's how I, uh, that's, that's the kind of uh, way I characterize myself that I'm most comfortable with. In terms of, uh, you know, starting to build something, trying to get things accomplished, uh, having a day that's filled um, with uh, work that can make a difference. And I would say that that's something that was instilled in me from a very early age. Uh, uh, I have a grandmother who's 95 that's still with us. Oh, that's good. And uh, she was very, very big into productivity. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about, talking about the early age. Um, where were you born? And, and give us a glimpse of the life of Cheryl at the age of 9 and 15. Wow. Uh, yes, as I said before, I was born in Barbados mm -hmm. in the West Indies. Um, and I had an extremely happy childhood. 
Um, and I think, it, you know, people, you know, we're in some senses, <clears throat> one way of describing, you know, who a person is is the sum total of uh, experiences. I think it's more than that, but it's a it's a starting point. And I would say that um, that childhood at age nine in Barbados, going to school, um, climate has a lot to do with it. I mean, there are studies that that that, that demonstrate that. But um, just having a very solid, happy childhood, um, where where um, you had the support of an extended family, grandmother, grandfather, mother, father, aunts, uncles, and really putting your heart and soul uh, into playing and, and into trying to achieve uh, whatever it was for you to achieve as a nine-year-old mm -hmm. and fe making, you know, um, having that family make you feel that you could achieve it. At 15, I would say I was a very, um, not somber, but I was very serious for my age, and I always wanted to ask ultimate questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I asked a lot of questions, and I, I still do. <laughs> but, you know, I, I would say at 15 years old, I was an avid reader uh -huh. um, and always concerned about uh, the backstory behind things, the solving of puzzles. So, uh, you know, and I, I think that a lot that a lot of that had to do with, I was pre predisposed to that um, kind of thinking and, and, tra and, and ways of training myself to think. Uh, and I would credit a lot of that to my dad, mm -hmm. who was a very deep thinker and a very strategic kind of person. Um, give you a quick example. Um, he taught me how to play, we call it draft back then, but people say it here, checkers. And he beat me a hundred games and I wouldn't cry, but he would, he would really beat me badly. Mm. Uh, lovingly, but badly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then I stuck with it and when I won my first game off of him, I was doing the dance because I know he didn't give it to me. So, you know, that's kind of uh, a, like a brief anecdote of, of what I was like at 15 years old. Just, just liking challenges and, and, and learning how and, and having my dad give me the key to how to withstand a lot of, you, you know, a lot of adversity there in, in those games. <laughs> Let me jump forward a little yeah. bit and, uh, and then I come back to your early timeline. That dance, that enjoyment, that jubilation because you, you, you won something that wasn't given to you. Do you recognize that child and that dance when you win some of your cases today? Um, some of the top ones. Yeah. Um, the dance is it's less gleeful. Mm -hmm. But it's there. Uh, you never get and nor should I think you shouldn't want to divorce yourself entirely from your childhood right i think there's a lot in play it, that you should want to carry with you until the day you die but um the reason i say it is not as gleeful mm -hmm. is that it has to do oftentimes uh, with the with people's lives or livelihoods so i do employment law, for instance, employment discrimination law, where I'm going into courts trying to, um, you know, stand up for the rights of someone who uh, felt discriminated against on a job, for instance, mm -hmm. or if it is a severe per, uh, personal injury case, uh, you know, dealing with severe injury, I'm dealing with a person who um, may have suffered uh, terribly uh, pain and suffering having to do with a medical procedure. So their life is not really the same as it was. Um, in the case of family, sometimes it's a wrongful death case and they've lost, they've lost um, a loved one. So any victory that I can achieve in the courtroom will never make those people whole. Mm. So 
it's not the same glee, but you're glad when you can use right. your offices and you can use all the tools that you have to go in and, and, and get a win. And you don't get the win there on that particular day. You get the win, I think, early it comes when you start to identify a path through the thicket yes. that the law can be. And through all the noise, there's a lot of noise uh, in every profession and in, 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 in every job that you do. And you have to try to you have to try to identify a path to win. Uh, and what is winning becomes a question, but winning is always doing the best you can under the circumstances for your client. So yeah, uh, long-winded answer. The child and the playfulness is still there um, about wanting to get results and you never want to divorce yourself from it, but you're dealing in a higher state uh, you're dealing with higher stakes when you're dealing with um, people's lives, people's livelihood, um, or the, the loss of a, a loved one who really cannot be replaced. Let's revisit that child and bring your 95-year-old grandmother into this conversation. <laughs> the, productivity, the productivity lady. Um, what favorite memories do you have of your mother and your grandmother? Wow. As a child. Um, they are many. Mm. Um, so on the, pro on the productivity note, it would be like this. Um, she had a, lot of, a house with a lot of land on it. And on a Saturday, if you came to visit her or you happened to stay there the night before, um, and there was really nothing to do by my measure or by anybody else's measure there'd be nothing to do but for these kids to kind of sit around and play and do things and gran would have a totally different idea she'd pick up a bucket and a pail and send you out to the gr ground to pick up rocks and you had to fill that bucket with stones you know little stones and because she wanted her garden beds where she planted rows of lettuce and rows of cabbages and all kinds of she wanted it to be perfect and this was the best way to keep these idle youngsters to work that was going to serve a purpose in the end because we're going to be served from that garden at some point <laughs> um you know other memories um well, my mom was less driven in that way um but you know you would have to help out but i remember um you know, climbing on the roof and flying a, a, a kite that we would make out of uh, coconut twigs and, and a piece of paper. And then you had to be careful not to tear up a bed sheet to get the tail for the kite. You know, things like that. Right. Um, beautiful, beautiful breezes, you know, coming through uh, on top of that roof. And, and it was a tin roof, but it wasn't hot to the foot because you had all that breeze coming through. Um, going out to this huge set of land and, and, and picking um, lettuces with my grandmother and she would put her hand down and pull out say a tomato and eat it right right there. That's what comes to mind wow. as I sit right here. But my childhood was a lot like that. Like that. Yeah. So uh, these two women, matriarchs, what kind of story do you remember them telling the, the grandchildren? What is a favorite story you remember? Wow. Um, there are so many stories, but um, my grandmother used to tell stories of how when she was a kid, her mother died very early. Mm. Her mother died when she was um, four years old. Her mother died in childbirth with a sister that lived. And after my grandmother, after, after her mother died, she went to live with her mother, which was her mother's mother. And unfortunately, um, I guess what would be my great, great grandmother didn't live long. She then died two years later. 
So she died when my grandmother was six years old. Um, but before that, Grand always used to tell the story that she remembered when she was five or six years old, she had very distinct memories of seeing her grandmother, who was a laborer, you know, in, in, in some kind of agricultural area, um, get up early in the morning making the food that she was going to take with her um, to the farm and making sure that my grandmother, um, who would often be carried along, had her own little satchel of, of lunch. Um, that's something that um, my grandmother talks about um, on occasion, um, and she's still pretty clear on, on some of those details. Um, but it is her telling the story of kind of her last link mm. to her grandmother. And, and so in telling the story to us, to myself and, and my cousins, um, it kind of pushes it a little pushes it a little further down the road. Mm. Um, but um, that, that's, those stories are near, and that particular story is near and dear to, to her. Let's fast forward a little bit. You're here in the United States. You're at Tilden High School. Having ha gone to some of, or one of the best public schools in Barbados, what was your academic culture shock? Well, I discovered for the first time what an elective was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Choice. Yeah, you know, so um, the school that I went to in Barbados was not a special school. It was just a, uh, you know, the, the, at the time, and I don't, I can't speak of it now, but at the time, things were pretty stratified. You know, you would sit for, you would sit at some point, you would sit for some exams, and you could get into top tier school, middle tier schools, or regular school. I went to a regular school. Mm -hmm. um, and, but as a mark of how good we were, at one point back then, uh, as small as it was, Barbados had one of the highest literacy rates in the world. Mm -hmm. And it was because even at a so-called regular school, mm -hmm. you got schooled in the classics, you know, Shakespeare, you, you know, you, you, you did all of that, all of um, the greatest poetry, you know, uh, all the poets and so on that, that, that you can, from Keats back. So um, I thought I had a, an excellent education there, and it prepared me. I came here, uh, unfortunately, as I said, I did not know what an elective was. Um, no one gave me a kind of high school, American high school for dummies. I didn't know what one did, for instance, um, to how, do you, how did you move from high school to college? Mm -hmm. What are the defining moments in that high school career that determines if you're going to a good college or not? I did know something about stratification, but I wasn't even very clear mm -hmm. on the difference between an Ivy League school and a city school. I, I didn't know any of that. And my mother, um, my father stayed in Barbados and I came here with my mom, she did not know anything about that either. So she wasn't able to kind of help me mm -hmm. in that. All I knew is that my parents expected me to be excellent at whatever was given to me to study in school. And that's the way it just had to be. It, there wasn't any ifs, ands, or maybes about it. So when I got to Tilden, I discovered about multiple choice as well. <laughs> no such thing. I, I'm, I was accustomed to, I, I did get, I did sit to O level, uh, before two old levels before I left Barbados in English and history, I passed those. Um, but I was accustomed to writing essays, right? And you know, presenting an argument and making sure that it was coherent and cohesive, and all of that went out through the window. So um, it it was a little bit of um, a um, an awakening. Mm -hmm. I would say a great awakening where. Um, I remember taking a test. It was the first important test. And so I was doing really well in my classes, mm -hmm. getting 90s and teachers happy with me and happy with my behavior. Because one of the things that happened to me is that 
uh, I became a better student and I became more studious when I came here. Mm -hmm. um, studying always came easy to me and I, I back in Barbados I was young and I, I really wasn't always into working hard because I felt I had it easy. Mm -hmm. Coming into a new system where I didn't know so much, it made me a little bit more studied about what I was doing. And so I took this test and failed it. So my guidance counselor called me in and said, well, I don't know how you're getting all these 90s in class because you must be, you must be cheating because this test tells me that you're a dunce. What had occurred was that I was not accustomed to multiple choice. So I say I answered question number four. I put it in a, the wrong bubble. And then everything after that point was wrong because even if in my mind, if I knew the answer, I filled in the wrong bubble. I was on the wrong line. Oh. So I was so dejected and so disappointed in myself and um, felt awful that this person thought that I was just kind of didn't have any value. And I said, set the test up for me again. I want to take that test up again. And she was like, well, what's the point? And my recollection is is a little bit foggy at this point, but I think there were several, there were like several months before I could take, there was a period before I could take that test again. In the meantime, before this person who had concluded that I was a dunce would send me to a, a, a situation where I could get the, re, the remediation she thought I needed, mm -hmm. she sent me, go upstairs, go work in the English department and basically it was a service period and call it was called service but basically you're running errands in the uh in the english department well i got to the english department and the man i met there was malcolm largman who cut a very huge figure i mean he was the figure he cut in a room was he looked like he was 11 feet mm. in truth you know, I don't think he, he's maybe 5'9", <laughs> if so much. <laughs> what a child, right? Yeah, but um, no, he would, um, there would be boys who would run around the, the hallway bouncing the balls, you know, bouncing their balls in school. And the minute he showed up in the hallway, everything went back to, yes, sir. And, and, and he really, he really um, you know, was an impressive figure. Uh, and a great disciplinarian authority, a uh, person of authority, but with kindness, you know? Um, so I came under his wing and in talking to me and in <clears throat> he got to find out my story. He found out I was from Barbados and the whole deal and took, took an interest and looked at my, probably looked at, you know, some of my report cards or whatever uh, and read one of my essays. And he thought, well, this kid can write. She's got the issues that a, a 15 and a half, 16 year old would have. And uh, had me um, submit something to him and I got into an advanced placement English class. When, once I met him, I found out what the criteria was for how people were measured to figure out where they were gonna go after high school, which I never knew. So he really filled in that missing piece for me. I didn't know that, you know, you would be, they would count your advanced placement courses. I didn't know anything about, um, you know, the three ACT tests. I didn't know anything about the SAT scores. I didn't know any of that. So um, I would credit him with kind of giving me um, the tools, giving me um, the tools, and as I said before, that American High School for Dummies book, mm -hmm. um, basically he filled all of that for me and was a great mentor of mine. I would have to say that even once I got, to my, I got into Mount Holyoke, just on the basis of my scores, and once I got there, uh, there were people there were there were impressive professors there, but nothing compared to this man. I mean, he he was a he was um, so far above um, as a teacher of literature and English um, that uh, I would 
bet on him against anybody who who who, who taught me um, once I got to college. But going back to trying to, I try not to digress, but going back to your original question. So yeah, it was a lot of culture shock. Mm. Uh, the final piece of that story is that I did take the test again and went off the charts. It was one of the highest scores that the school had ever had. Then that lady became very interested in me and started to say, oh, this is one of my students. Well, it had nothing to do with her. Mm -hmm. I, w what I required there was somebody to say, you know what, this is a kid from overseas. Mm -hmm. This kid may not know everything. Let me find out what's going on. But I don't know if it was her, um, you know, her caseload. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she was predisposed to thinking that way I don't I don't know what it was based on but um, it was basically a throwaway and mm -hmm. my feeling is that <clears throat> if a student is lagging behind in any regard they don't need two service periods batting around in an English department they need somebody to take them back to nuts and bolts so it, she should have been sending me to get whatever remediation she thought I need it to fill yeah, that gap in. Well, well, I guess fate intervened. Yeah, it, it really did. If, if you had not met Malcolm Lagman, I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, yes. Lagman. Lagman. What do you think would have happened to your academic trajectory? Oh uh, boy, that is a really, really difficult question to answer. Um, of course I was doing well and getting 90s and 90 plus in every class I was doing but <clears throat> beyond a grade and beyond a performance in a particular class I think he kind of rolled out a carpet mm. and I just stepped on it yeah. um, and so yes were there other teachers in that school that could have done the same yeah we had great teachers I mean Tilden was a great school mm -hmm at that time and we're taught I graduated from Tilden in 1979 and we're going way back okay <laughs> so um yeah there were but, but I don't know that I would have landed yeah um w with anybody who took that kind of interest I mean for put, put, put it this way I mean if you wrote something for him that was lazy um and it wasn't well punctuated or it just lacked unity you would just be murdered. I mean, you know. <laughs> you make you bleed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I remember him one day, um, having me get up in class to read something, and I was kind of nervous, and you know, read it kind of choppily. And then another day, I wrote something and I gave it to him, and um, he told me, "You see this? This is the most." This piece of writing that you gave me has some of the most sophisticated thoughts about this poem that I have received from anybody in your class, but you're getting a zero because your punctuation is abysmal. Don't ever give me a piece of work like that. Well, I cried in his office. and. I, I told him. I, I said I felt I feel so disappointed. You know, I think it was days later. I was still gloomy, and he said, "Come into my office." I go into his office, and um, I said, I, "You know, I have these doubts. Will I ever make something of myself?" And without trying to give me the keys to the kingdom, he basically said to me, "Look, you gotta concentrate on what you're doing." And everything that you do, you have to do it well. Fast forward to 19, to, to um, the year, say 1996, 97, you know, when I'm, you know, uh, that would probably have been more like 98, 99, when I am reviewing and training young lawyers at my old firm. Mm -hmm. And they're bringing in loads of junk and handing it to a senior lawyer and saying, here, take it. And I could hear that reverb. And I, I, I've never lost what he said. Do your best work. Don't hand it in to me until it's 
you've been you've proved it until you've agonized about does this phrase belong there or would it be better two sentences away i mean so um boy it, you know the man was and remained